Hey campers, welcome back to day four of Maker Camp. I'm your camp director, M. Mota, and today is mostly all about Raspberry Pi. So thankfully we are visiting with a man who literally wrote the book on Raspberry Pi. We're visiting with Matt Richardson, who is in Brooklyn, New York. Hey. You there, Matt? Hey, yeah, Matt. how's it going? Good, Matt. How are you doing? Good, good. Good, good. And we're also joined by our counselors. You want to introduce yourself, counselors? I uh, can't hear you. That's Brian Milani and Dan Spangler. They're in our Dan Spangler. I'm the head fabricator. <laughs> hey, Dan. Hey, how's it going? Good. How's it going over there, guys? Pretty good. It's a little good. cold. Yeah. You ready for <laughs> yeah. some uh, Raspberry <laughs> Pi? Totally. Awesome. Great. Well, um, I think we're going to go ahead and watch a brief introduction to Raspberry Pi that Matt produced. So let's go Sounds to that good. now. Looking forward. Here at Make, we love Raspberry Pi, the $35 mini computer that hails from the United Kingdom. In this video, I'm going to show you how to get your Raspberry Pi up and running so that you can start hacking, playing, and experimenting with it. The Raspberry Pi doesn't just work right out of the box. There are a few extra accessories you'll need to use it, and you may have some of them in your workshop already. The first thing you need is a 5 volt power supply that has a micro USB connector on it. Be aware that not all 5 volt power supplies are created equal. Look for one that can supply at least 700 milliamps. You can check the adapter to see how much current it can supply. You'll also need an SD card. Get one with at least 4 gigabytes. You'll need to load up Raspbian, Raspberry Pi's custom distribution of Linux, onto the card. Just follow the instructions on the download page for how to download it and write it to the card. Be aware it's not as simple as drag and drop, but they outline the steps very well to make it fairly painless. To connect to the internet, you'll need an ethernet cable that will connect to your router. If you can't do that, you can also share your computer's Wi-Fi connection to its ethernet port. The Raspberry Pi also supports USB Wi-Fi adapters. If you'd like to use your Raspberry Pi directly rather than over your network, you'll need a few more things. You'll need a monitor that you can connect to via HDMI or composite right. along with the appropriate cable. If your monitor doesn't have either of those connections, you'll need to use an adapter. Favor using the HDMI connector if possible for a better picture. You'll also need a USB keyboard and mouse. I recommend connecting those through a powered USB hub if you have one of those. To get your Pi up and running, insert the SD card into the slot. Be careful not to use this capacitor as a way of pushing the card into the board as it can snap off. Connect your mouse and keyboard to the Pi. Connect your monitor using your display connector. Connect your Pi via Ethernet to your network. Lastly, connect the power supply. The Raspberry Pi has no on switch, so shortly after you plug it in, you should see the Raspberry Pi logo along with some diagnostic text scrolling by on your monitor. The first time you boot it up, it brings you into a configuration tool. Use your keyboard to navigate these menus. You'll want to do a few things. First, choose to expand the root partition of the SD card. Alright, I think we're going to go so ahead and cut here. All the free space on your card. Overscan is a feature that shrinks the display image down so that the edges don't get cut. Alright, cool. very cool. So, um, I should say a few things before we, we jump back with Matt here. Um, Okay, so one thing we're really encouraging you guys to do is to make your own hangout and invite other campers to join. So, uh, you know, start a hangout, go to the Maker Camp community and uh, post it there and invite people to join and watch our hangout live, right? It's a pretty cool thing. If you're not in a makerspace or a library, that's something you can do. Uh, also, if you have any questions at all, go ahead and post them in the Maker Camp community and we'll do our best to answer them with Matt live. Cool. All right, Matt. So, um, yeah, let's let's jump right into it. I'm I'm hungry for some Raspberry Pi. So <laughs> good, good. Yeah. We've uh, got a lot of it. So yeah, you wrote you literally wrote the book on Raspberry Pi. 
It's got yes. your name on it. Yeah, Sean Wallace book. and I, uh, we teamed up. We wrote the Getting Started with Raspberry Pi book. Um, it was really exciting to do because Raspberry Pi was really new at the time. So as we were exploring the platform and figuring things out, we were writing everything down, jamming it into the book, and getting everything in there that helped us get started with Raspberry Pi so that people didn't have to figure everything out on their own, and they could on their own you really go from zero to Raspberry Pi in no time at all. So you really don't need to know anything to get started with Raspberry Pi if you've got the book. And, you know, because out there, there is a lot of information out there, but it, it tends to be spread out all over the place. And we just wanted to kind of bring it all together and provide the tips that we found that were helpful when we were getting started with Raspberry Pi. Yeah, great. That's great. Yeah, I've, I've checked it out, and uh, there's so much to learn. Um, why don't we start off with some of the basics? What is a Raspberry Pi? Sure. A Raspberry Pi is essentially a computer. It's got a keyboard. You can plug in a keyboard and mouse over USB. It's got a port to connect a monitor to. If you've got a newer monitor or a TV that has HDMI, you can connect it here. If you have an old TV, uh, you can connect it via composite here. Um, and you can connect it to the Internet as well. There's an Ethernet jack, or as I said in the video, a USB Wi-Fi adapter will work as well. So when you plug all that stuff in, keyboard, monitor, mouse, and then you plug it into the Internet, you can actually just use it like a computer connected to the Internet if you want. It's got a web browser. You can, you can, go to, you, you can send emails. You can do all, all kinds of stuff like that. But this one is a little different because it, it's different than a regular computer because it's only $35. And, and that's what really is the big difference between this and a regular computer. Definitely. That's definitely one of the parts that makes it exciting. So it's a full-fledged computer. I mean, you can literally use it as a computer, right? You, you can. Um, it's not going to be as powerful as the computers you'll find in homes today. Right. It's pretty serviceable. The, the chip that's in here is about as powerful as like an early iPhone or a Kindle or something. It, it can do a lot. Um, you're not going to be able to really like, you know, do some like serious 3D gaming or anything. Right. But you, you can pull up web pages. You can write emails. You can watch videos. Um, it's just you know, you, you kind of want to, like, get your expectations right. So if you're used to a really fast computer that responds really quickly, yeah. when you plug your, your uh, mouse and keyboard into this, sometimes the clicks can be a little slow. Sometimes you double-click on a, a program to open it up. It can take a little bit of time. But it, it really it does work, though, as a computer. That's great. That's great. So uh, what are some of the things that make this really exciting? Is it the price point? The, I think the main thing is the price. The $35, right. it means that if you want to experiment with a computer, if you want to hack around with it, you don't have to be afraid of breaking a computer in your house. If you share a computer with your whole family and you want to hack around with it and you mess it up, that puts yeah. it out of commission for the whole family. Okay. So at $35, you can have your own, and also you can hack around with it without being afraid of, of breaking it. Because if you do... It was only thirty-five dollars. It wasn't, you know, five hundred dollars and up, which right. is that's the best point of it. And um, out there, uh, Linus Torvalds, who's the guy who created Linux, which is the operating system that runs on this, he said, and I think this is a great way to put it: it allows kids to afford failure, and that's important. You don't want there to be, totally. you don't want failures to be very expensive. You want a failure to be cheap so that you don't have to be fearful of making a mistake. And with this, the best part about it is you don't have to be afraid to make, to make a mistake. There you go. So how does it compare to, say, an Arduino? Can you do similar things? Can you do different things? Yeah, it, it's similar to an Arduino, um, but they're very, very different. And a lot of people ask me about that. They say, oh, Raspberry Pi, it's better than an Arduino, right? And I say, well, not necessarily. It, it's just different. Uh, an Arduino, let's see if I got one in my, uh, my bins here. Here we go. Arduino looks something like that. And you guys have talked about Arduino before on, on camp, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So here's, here's the two of them. Uh, an Arduino is, is dedicated to doing a single task at a time. When you program it and you program it to do things with these pins, it just does exactly what you say it to when you turn it on, and that's it. It doesn't do much more. On the Raspberry Pi, it's a full-on computer. So if you program it to do something, it can, it can do that, but it can also do this other thing over here. So it can download an image, and it can also you know, light up some LEDs if you want. Gotcha. Now, the, 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 the sort of differences get a little bit uh, more... Uh, yeah, there, there are plenty of differences between them. You know, like if you want to hook up sensors, it's a little bit easier to hook them up to an Arduino than it is to hook them up to a Raspberry Pi. 
um, because there, uh, there are these analog inputs on an Arduino. And uh, gotcha. the, the other thing is that the Raspberry Pi has the video outputs, and the Arduino does not have that. So it depends on what kind of project you want to make. If you want to make a really, really simple project that's just buttons and LEDs, I think Arduino is a good possibility to use. Uh, if you want to use video, if you want to draw something on screen, if you want to connect to the internet, you may want to check out what the Raspberry Pi can do for you. Very cool. That's a, that's a great question. I, I, I get that a lot. That's a great question. Okay. So, um, okay. So, an Arduino would be used, say, for controlling some LEDs in a certain uh, fashion. Uh, cool. You can do the same thing with a Raspberry Pi, right? Yeah, a absolutely. The Raspberry Pi also has these pins on it, these GPIO, General Purpose Input and Output Pins. Now, these pins you can connect to, let's say, LEDs or motors or something and actuate them just like you can with the Arduino. This is actually is another reason this is a lot different than your home computer, because yeah. your home computer doesn't actually have pins like this that you can just use to control uh, you know, a motor or an LED. There's nothing really to hook into. And so that's another reason why the Raspberry Pi is a little bit more hacker and maker friendly than uh, a normal computer is. Very cool. So um, you can theoretically, uh, with those GPIO pins, hook up a breadboard and kind of prototype circuits and all that jazz? Yeah, absolutely. Take a breadboard. You can hook it up. There are uh, a couple tools that help you hook up this to a breadboard. You can hook up buttons, switches. You can hook up sensors. Um, there, there are ways to do pretty much everything you can do with the Arduino on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, if not, at the very least, you can also connect your uh, Raspberry Pi to the Arduino over USB. So if there are sensors you want to use, or there's a Raspberry Pi, I'm sorry, a Arduino Shield, or there's an Arduino project that you made uh, that you don't want to give up, you can connect it over USB to the Raspberry Pi and have it communicate over the USB cable. So wow. if you, yeah, if you want to put like a project online, let's say you built an Arduino project, you put a lot of time into it, and you want to put it online, uh, one way to do that is to use the Raspberry Pi, and it'll it'll send the data over USB. You you have to do some programming on both sides to get it right, but it, it's it's just in the realm of possibility. It's one way to do it, and there are many ways to do everything. Very cool. So in theory, you could use a Raspberry Pi connected to an Arduino to program the Arduino. Is yeah. That right? Absolutely. If you've got the Raspberry Pi hooked up to keyboard, monitor, and mouse, you can load up the Arduino development environment where you write all the code and upload right. it, and you just plug in the Arduino and you'll upload it to the port. I think Raspberry Pi and Arduino go together really, really well. So right. if you're experimenting a little bit with Arduino, you may want to try Raspberry Pi and vice versa, because both of them use a lot of the same concepts, but they're totally different, but very complementary. They work with each other really, really well. Awesome. So um, in terms of programming for the Raspberry Pi, what, what's the language that we'd be learning? That's a, nut, that's a big difference between Arduino and Raspberry Pi, whereas okay. on Arduino, you're using just one language. You're using like a, a kind of a C, C++ language that has extra libraries built in to make it easier to do certain things. Um, on a Raspberry Pi, you can almost use any language you want. It's a computer, so it, as long as there's someone out there who's written a compiler or an interpreter to take the code you've written and turn it into a program, you can load that on a Raspberry Pi and do that. So a lot of people uh, use Python uh, and, and right. write code with Python. It's actually what I prefer using because I really like Python a lot. Um, you can use Java, you can use C or C++. Um, there are plenty of libraries out there that make it easier to use all of these things and have those languages interface with the GPIO pins on the board. Uh, and there's even a graphical programming language called Scratch, which lets real beginners with coding uh, dabble in there a little bit and, and drag things around and make animations and make little mini games and so on. Very cool. Yeah, maybe we can check that out in a few minutes. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just a reminder, if you're just joining us, we're talking with Matt Richardson, who's actually in Brooklyn, New York. He and Sean Wallace are co-authors of Getting Started with Raspberry Pi. Uh, and we're also joined by Dan Spangler and Brian Milani in the makerspace. What's up, guys? Hello, guys. <laughs> hey, uh, looks like we have a few questions from campers, actually, Matt. Great. We could. So um, got a question by Sean. He's asking, what kind of processor does the Raspberry Pi have? The, the the processor on the Raspberry Pi is an ARM 11 processor. It's the same kind of processor that's in a lot of mobile phones out there. 
iPhone, and so on. What's great is that um, Linux, as an operating system, runs on this oh, and cool. on this kind of processor. And so that's the operating system you use. If you're used to Mac OS or Windows, those don't really run on ARM very well. So uh, you, you're you're using Linux, but it's actually a really great experience. So ARM ARM 11. Very cool. Okay, and uh, a camper from YouTube is asking, when was Raspberry Pi created? Oh, okay. So that it was released over a year ago. Um, it was in I want to say February. Um, they had announced it uh, maybe let's say two about two years ago. I, I don't want to get the I may have the timeline a little wrong, but right, when yeah. they when they announced it, uh, people didn't believe it. It, it. This was maybe two years ago. Thirty five dollars for for a computer, and yeah, people I were remember. really yeah people were <laughs> yeah. really excited about it. But there was no idea when it was actually going to ship, and so I, I, even I was a little bit skeptical. I was like, you know what? I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I have it in my hands. And so I finally did get one in my hands. Uh, a year ago, I think it was in last March, uh, I mean, the March before last, um, and so they've been out in the world for a year, they've shipped over a million units now, um, and so, yeah, it, it's it's still a pretty new technology compared to what else is out there. Gotcha. Cool. Um, well, do you want to show us a bit of Scratch? Yeah, sure. So, I, let me, uh, I have my Raspberry Pi hooked yeah. up to this computer here. Let me see if I can switch to my Raspberry Pi, uh, that'll take... Second here. Yeah, no problem. Uh, if all goes well, you should see the desktop instead of my um, mug. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Great. Very okay. Cool. So after you set up the Raspberry Pi and you've booted it up, um, you'll you'll usually get a text prompt. It doesn't look like this at all, but you can type the command start x. It, it's all one word, and it'll bring you into this desktop environment. Cool. And in this desktop environment is a lot like the desktop environments you're used to. Now, if you know Linux, you'll probably be very, very familiar th with this. But if you come from a Mac or a Windows computer, uh, it, it may feel a little different, but everything pretty much works the same. You know, you've got icons on the desktop that you can double-click to open up programs. Um, you know, I just opened up the terminal there. I'm uh, closing it like that. So um, this really looks like a full-fledged computer. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. You've got kind of a, a, a knockoff start menu kind of thing going on here. Mm -hmm. The internet browser is called Midori instead of like Chrome or Firefox. Right. Um, I, I would show you, I would show that to you, but I don't have my uh, Pi hooked up to the net right now. Um, and then you've got some bunch of tools and utilities that make it easier to to write programs and playing around with things. Now I promised you I would show you a little bit of Scratch, so let me open okay. that now. I'm going to double click that. It's on the desktop. Okay. And uh, hopefully you're you're going to you'll be able to see this uh, well. Uh, what I have here are a bunch of functions and controls that I can use. Um, and then over here I've got a stage that I can animate things on. And right now there's a cat on the stage. I'm going to uh, take the cat off of the stage now. I'm going to put a different no. character. Yeah. Come <laughs> Sorry. Back, Kitty. Come back. Yeah. No. Well, I got something better. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to put a new. Uh, I'll put a different animal on there. Uh, I'll put a bat on the stage. Oh, okay. Okay. So now this this character is called a sprite, and it, you can interact with it. You can you can animate it. You can move it around on screen. You can change it around. Right now he looks like he's frozen in mid like flight, and we want to make that look a little bit more interesting. So we want him to flap his wings, right? Absolutely. So if we go to costumes, we can add a new costume for that character, which is just a different way it's going to look. So I'm going to click import, and then there's another costume with the bat's wings down. Okay. So ah, there we go. So now if I click between these two costumes, it kind of looks like he's flapping his wings, right? Yeah. Now, Sorry. this is a computer, and we should be able to program that to do that automatically, don't you think? We shouldn't have to click every time we want it to flap its wings. So right. let's try that out. Uh, it, uh, all right, let me get out of that. Um, if I hit scripts, it, when I hit the scripts tab, I, I have a little blank area here that I can drag these different functions into. So I'm going to take this, uh, go to the control settings, and take this action that says, do something when the green flag is clicked. So up over here, I've got that green flag. Okay. Anything I attach to this block here will execute when I click the green flag. So let's say we wanted to change its costume. Let's go to looks. And then we're going to say next costume, like that. Okay. So now okay. when the green flag is clicked, go to the next costume. Now, so watch what happens. I click it once. Okay, he changed. I click it again. He changed. If I click it a lot, you can see it's changing. But it, he stops when I stop clicking. Right. So what we want we want to do is we want to program it to loop over and over again, keep changing the costume over and over and over again. And how we do that is by creating a loop. 
I'm going to go into here and grab this loop that says forever. I'm going to take this next costume thing away. I'm going to put forever in here. And anything I put in this little blank gap in here will go on and on and on and on until we hit the stop sign. So let's that's, drag that in yeah. there. That's, that's a right. really easy way of learning the basics of programming there. Yeah, absolutely. All icon that's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's using a lot of the same kind of ideas that, that programming has where a lot of what you're doing is saying, if this, do then do that, or loop this, or loop that, or whatever. So now I have this forever loop. It says next costume. If I hit the green flag, let's see what happens. Now he's kind of like going a little crazy there. That's not yeah. really what we want. Doesn't look like a flying bat at all, right? It looks cool, though. <laughs> <laughs> it looks cool, and if that's the effect you're going for, you can certainly stop right here if you wanted to. But what I think we what we should do is we should put a little delay in so that it'll change the costume, and then wait, and then change the costume again. And luckily, we can put in extra extra functions in here. So I'm going to take this wait function, drag it into the uh, setup here, and put it right below af so after the next costume thing. So it'll say, change the next costume, wait one second, do it again. Change the next costume, wait one second, do it again. Let's hit the flag again and see what happens. OK, now we went from oh, cool. a super fast bat to a very, very <laughs> slow bat. He's taking so, his time. Yeah, he's taking his time. So if we want to make it look a little bit more uh, realistic, let's speed it up a little bit. I want to do, let's say, half a second. So it says wait one second. I'm going to put 0.5 for half a second. And I'll let go. OK, he's going a little faster, there but still... Let's make it a little faster. Let's try. Uh, let's make it uh, twice as fast. So I'll make it 0.25. There we go. Okay, that looks like it's. That looks he's, pretty good, doesn't he's it? It's going somewhere. Yeah, he's going faster. somewhere. A little, a little faster. faster. A little faster. Yeah, a little okay. Faster. All right, a little faster. We'll do 0.1 seconds, a tenth of a second. There we go. Yeah, now he looks like nice. he's getting somewhere. All right. Okay. Uh, everybody happy with that speed? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, uh, so Matt, we have a few questions actually yeah, sure. from, from campers. Okay, uh, great. Let's see. Let's start off with: uh, Can you use Xcode for an IDE for Raspberry Pi? Uh, you you cannot. Xcode will only work on the Macintosh. Unfortunately, there are uh, you know you, there are ways that you can program on your own computer and use let's say Xcode on your Macintosh and then upload that code to the board if you're used okay. to using Xcode. But it's not going to do the compiling. You're not going to be able to use Xcode directly on the Raspberry Pi. But I think if you're used to using it as a text editor, you can definitely edit the text and then upload it. Uh, in fact, I, I use a text editor called Sublime. And I have it set up right. so that I, FTP, I use FTP to connect to my Raspberry Pi. And then all I do is every time I hit save in, in my text editor, it automatically uploads the new code to the Raspberry Pi, which makes it really convenient. Yeah. You know, it, it makes it really easy. So I can use the, the, the tools I'm used to and, and, uh, and have that just get pushed over to the Raspberry Pi every time I save. Setting that up, it took a little bit of time, but it, once I got it working, it was great. Yeah, that's pretty slick. So you're using Sublime as your, your basic text editor. Does Sublime have FTP built in? I think it does, but I actually use Transmit and gotcha. Transmit as the FTP client to connect to the Raspberry Pi so I can look at the files on it. And so when, I, when I'm in this FTP client looking at the files on the Raspberry Pi, I can actually just like right click on it and say, open with Sublime. And I tried oh, that once. And I was like, "Oh, that's useful." And I wrote the code, and by uh, it was like a habit for me to hit, you know, Apple S, you know, Command S right, to, to save it. Yeah. And when I did that, it said "uploaded to the board." I was like, "Oh, <laughs> <That'll> <laughs> that <laughs> is useful. <laughs> that will <laughs> save a lot of time. I don't have to save it and drag it or anything." So now I just write, 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 and save. So I, I presume you could do the same thing and hook up Xcode the same way. Awesome. Okay, so uh, we've got a question here from Trinell. Uh, is there a way to communicate wirelessly between the Arduino and the Raspi? Yes. Y y yes, there is. It's it, not without a little bit of work and a little bit of hardware. Um, there are a few ways that you could possibly do it. Um, you could get like an Arduino Wi-Fi and have the Raspberry Pi plug in a USB Wi-Fi adapter, and they can communicate with each other over Wi-Fi. That's one possibility. Sorry. Um, another possibility is to use an XB radio, which I, I might have in my bins here. Yeah, here we go. This is an XB radio. It, it, they're really neat things. Um, what you do with them is you, you can connect them to a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino, and they 
take care of connecting to each other, and they act as basically an invisible cable from one to another. So once you wire this thing into an Arduino or Raspberry Pi, it makes it really easy to connect with other things online. And I think these are great. These are a lot of fun to play with, because if you have 10 yeah. of these, you could have one module communicate to all 10 of them and have like a you know, wireless light show going on, or you can have this just communicate to other ones. This is a great way to make like a wireless remote control. And I think also a good possibility for a way you can communicate between an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi. Though it does bring the budget of your project up a little bit, I think each of these modules are about $20. I see. So uh, the XB, does that create its own wireless network? Or is it a peer-to-peer -peer type situation? So there are different kinds of XBs out there that work on different types of protocols. Um, the uh, the actual protocol isn't Wi-Fi. It's its own thing. It's 802.11 or 802.something, .15. I don't know what the actual protocol is. But um, they will take care of, of communicating with each other over their own protocol. And you actually don't need to worry too much about the protocol itself. There is gotcha. another version, and, then, and that's all point to multi-point. So like I can, from one XB, talk to 10 XBs or 20 XBs, or have one XB talk to another XB directly. Um, there's another kind of XB out there that does mesh networking, where I can say something to this XB and have it pass the message along XB to XB to XB, making a big network that you know I, I don't need to directly connect to any single node. I can connect through other nodes. Anyway, XBs are really cool. I bet you we could do a whole other yeah. Maker Camp show on <laughs> Absolutely. XBs. Absolutely. Hey, OK, so we've got a couple more questions from campers. And if yeah. you have a question, feel free to post it up on the Maker Camp community. Uh, and we'll try our best to answer it, as we are now. These are so, great um, questions so far, by the way. These yeah, are really right. great. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got a question from a camper. Uh, he wants to know, how do you look at the desktop interface without plugging it directly into a monitor? That, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. Um, th there is a way to do that. So when you connect the Raspberry Pi to your network and you don't connect a monitor to it, you can run it headless. We, we call it headless, which is <laughs> logging in over the network. So I, I can log in and get the text-based terminal, and I can run text commands. I'm only seeing text. But there's another way to, to connect to it using something called VNC. And uh, I cannot think of what it means off the top of my head. Brian, Brian or Dan, do you what know you what VNC know? stands Brian. for? Virtual Network Controller or something. Hey, yeah. I'll take that. I'll take that. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so VNC is how you can do like remote desktop stuff. And you can connect to another computer and see its desktop. In fact, if you have Windows or Mac computers, Nowadays, they all have this built in. They may not call it VNC. They may call it like remote desktop or remote sharing of some kind. But it is still using VNC. So I can turn oh. VNC on. I need to install it and turn it on. And then over the network, I can connect to it. And then I get a window on my computer that shows the Raspberry Pi desktop. Very it's cool. still a little bit laggy. Like you move the mouse around, you can kind of see it trailing a little bit. You open things up because there's a lot of data that has to come over the pipe to show you stuff. But um, it does work, and, and, and actually works. It works pretty well. Okay. Um, would another option for basic stuff? Let's say you just needed a command line. Could you SSH into it? Yes, absolutely. If you uh, it, by by default SSH is turned off, and SSH is how you can log into a computer over text using and sending text commands and getting text back. And SSH is exactly how you would do it with Raspberry Pi. When you first turn on the Raspberry Pi, you get this sort of configuration screen. It's this blue screen. You use your keyboard to navigate through it and set things like the time zone, the type of keyboard you're using, all kinds of other things. One right. of the options in there is to turn SSH on so that you can log in remotely. And I think the reason they turn it off by default is because it's a bit of a security thing. They don't want to have open ports on a computer that other people can get into, especially Definitely. when everybody knows the default username and password for a Raspberry Pi. You don't want uh, someone jumping in there and, and tinkering with it. And I actually, you know what? I don't even think it's an issue of necessarily like security. I don't think anyone's going to do anything bad. But what, what happens is you get three or four people hacking around with Raspberry Pi in a hacker space or, or, or in, at a school, and they're all connected to the same network. You think you're connected to the right one, and you're doing all this stuff, and you're not seeing the LED light up on your board. 
someone else across the room says, why is the LED blinking on my Raspberry Pi? <laughs> oh, it's happened. It's oh, happened. So it's a good idea when you set up your Raspberry Pi to, you know, change maybe change the password is one way to make sure that you're getting into your Raspberry Pi. You can also change the host name, and you can say, you can call it, like, Matt's Pi or M's Pi so that you're sure you're connecting to the right one. So if there are people out there that are working in hacker spaces or in libraries and a lot of people want to work together, it's, it's one of those little tripping points on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, cool. So we've got a bunch of questions from campers. Great. Uh, and I can show more Scratch, too, if you want. I, I, yeah. But we, we can we take questions, should. whatever you guys want to do. Yeah, why don't we take a few questions and then Great. hop back into Scratch? Sounds good. All right. So uh, camper uh, Saneth is asking, uh, what are ways I could connect and work with my Raspberry Pi and Arduino? What are some projects I could do with it? P.S. I love your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, the ways of connecting to the Pi was the first question? Was yeah. That... What are some ways you can connect to the Pi, and what are some cool projects I could do with it? Sure. I, you know, the, those ways that we've discussed already, um, you know, the first and basic way is connecting the keyboard, mouse, monitor to it or you can connect over the internet, over SSH to do the terminal, or VNC to do the desktop. Um, there are other methods of connecting, like transferring files over FTP is possible, um, and uh, I, I think that pretty much rounds up the ways right. you'll, you'll, you'll connect to it. So you um, basically either use, initially, either use Ethernet to connect to it, um, and SSH in, um, yeah, so. yeah. Initially, what you want to do is definitely connect it to a monitor, keyboard, and mouse first, okay. because by default you're not going to be able to do much. Because as I said, like SSH is turned right. off. Okay. So if you turn on keyboard, monitor, mouse, plug them all in, you can then turn all those other things on so that you can access it that way. But yes, built in there is this Ethernet port right there, okay. and that's that's one way you'll connect. You'll connect this to your router. And then if, as long as you're connected to the same router, either over Wi-Fi or Ethernet, you'll be able to connect to this board. There are also those little USB, uh, I'm not going to try to find one right now in my bins, but there are those little USB Wi-Fi adapters. And right. you plug one in, and you can configure it with the desktop environment. This, you can say, hey, yeah, there you go. That's okay. exactly it. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is my Raspi. Good. Actually. You got a case for it, too. Yeah, I, I 3D printed a case for it, actually. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to use it for a, a little media center. There, there are a lot of great cases out there, um, right. and the ones you can download and print yourself, which is so cool. And then totally. there've got other ones that, like, you know, I've seen out there people take, like, make beautiful woodworked, milled out yeah. cases that look incredible. Pretty, um, pretty someone, rough. someone made for me this. They have a CNC mill in their home, which is incredible. I, I saw you, you were checking out CNC mills before. At, was it at Crucible? Yeah. Yeah. So someone who I know has a CNC mill made this for me. It was a way oh, for wow. me to. It, this is all, I think this is aluminum. Um, to stick the pie on here, I'd have to like uh, insulate it, and then I've got my breadboard there and connect it, and then I got this like nice base on it so that I can <laughs> that I can use it. A very, very nice uh, person sent me that. Um, That's cool. The, uh, the other question was what, um, what, what have I seen with, uh, people do with it? Was that the other one? What kind of projects can you do with it? Well, well yes, what kind of projects? I think the, the Raspberry Pi is well suited for any project that uses a monitor, first of all, because there are not a lot of things out there that are so cheap that can control a monitor. There are ways that you can have a, an Arduino, let's say, hook up to a television screen, but the, thing, the work you'll be doing is very, very basic. It'll be like having a block move around on screen, for instance. Um, so if you want to like, you know, show a photo, let's say you want to make your own like, slideshow mechanism that responds to buttons or, or motion or, or someone in the room, Arduino might, I mean, I'm sorry, Raspberry Pi might be really good at that because it can show photos pretty well and it can show video. Um, other, other ways you want to use the Raspberry Pi is with uh, sound. It has sound output on it, so if you have a project where you want different sounds to play, you can, you can use it for that. Um, you want to keep in mind also you've got these USB ports on here. So if you've got other USB devices, let's say a USB webcam, that yeah. is perfect for the Raspberry Pi because... Right. You, you can have images go in there. So if you wanted to make like a security camera that up, like let's say someone opens the door, it takes a picture and it'll email it to you. You could do that with a Raspberry Pi <laughs> and a regular USB webcam. That's awesome. Yeah, um, so there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty, plenty, plenty to do with Raspberry Pi. I, I got a question. 
Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, what about like a, a graphic control interface, like a touchscreen and you want to control motors with it or something like that? Absolutely. There are a bunch of different ways to make a graphical user interface with Raspberry Pi. You can build it on top of their Windows system if you want, and you can you know create a window, let's say, um, uh, like if you use Python, you can use a mm-hmm. module called TKinter. And it'll, basically it's your way of writing saying, draw a button here, draw a button here, draw a label here, and then do this when you click this button. And That's once really you have cool. that working, yeah, once you have that working and you got it working with a mouse, I'm sure you can find a some kind of monitor that will have a, a interface to to control the the click uh, the, 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 the the controlling the mouse via touch screen. But right. one way to do that is with TK Enter. Now, if you don't want to build on top of the X Window desktop environment and you'd rather yeah. have something that's a little bit more like a little bit closer to the metal there, and you don't want yeah. the whole thing to boot up. Um, mm-hmm. There are different packages out there that can draw on screen for you. One of them I used myself was called Open Frameworks, and Open okay. Frameworks is like it's a language. It's in C plus plus. It's a way of saying, draw a circle on screen here, draw this uh-huh. here, you know, put an image here, or place, you know, play a video. It's very very powerful. It can do a lot. And okay. I used it once. I made a um, I used Open Frameworks on Raspberry Pi to make a, I call it a dynamic bike headlight. I took a small <laughs> a cool projector, I, I took a small projector, I mounted it to the handlebars of my bike, and used Open Frameworks to have Raspberry Pi tell the projector to draw a circle that looks like a headlight. And then what I did was I hooked up a sensor to the wheel of my, my uh, the front wheel of my bike, and I was getting the revs off the wheel, and then it was able to display the speed at which I was going in the beam of the headlight. So That's really open, cool. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was so much fun. And Open Frameworks let me do that because it, it, like Open Frameworks is what I said, okay, draw a circle. Okay, now put this number in the circle. And then you, know, you can take this further and have, uh, have that project show you like, your next cross street. You can put like a GPS chip, let's say, on there. Have it show your next cross awesome. street. Oh. Turn-by-turn navigation for everybody. Yes. <laughs> yes, you, yes, turn by turn navigation, which is something I always wanted. I used to, when I, I bike around New York City, it's so confusing. I used to have to write out directions on uh, <laughs> paper and tape it to my handlebars. Now, I, if, if I can get GPS going on this thing and I can get figure out how to do the navigation, it would be so nice in the beam of the headlight to say, like, <laughs> the next awesome. turn is coming up. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking forward to that project, man. Yeah, we are. Yeah. I'll tell you, if, if, if any of you guys out there are good at that kind of stuff, I, I don't know that I, I've i got, like, the, the ability to figure out the whole navigation side of it, but I, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> well, there's an on-camera challenge, campers. Yes. Let's yes. figure out this navigation for uh, navigation. Raspberry Pi. Yep. Cool. Hey, Matt, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Could you, could you string multiple Raspberry Pis together to get a little more processing power out of it? Yes, yes, Good you question. can. They, they've, um, uh, there are a couple people out there. I think it was the University of Oxford or Oxford, whatever. Uh, they had took 64 Raspberry Pis and made a mini supercomputer out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, now you think about that. You, you, you tie together all these Raspberry Pis. It's, you know, it takes time, and you've got kind of a, you know, it's, it's still like a good amount of power. But what's cool about it was it was a great way for someone to learn. How to how how you build a supercomputer? What's yeah. involved in in tying together computers together to work together and take and take jobs and pass jobs along and make sure that every processor is being used and not a single processor is being used too much. And what's cool is that you know when each computer, each node of the compute of the supercomputer is only thirty five dollars, it mm-hmm. makes it very affordable to try to build your own cluster. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. Like I couldn't. Like I wouldn't dream of using like uh, like uh, full-on computers if I wanted to make my own su- supercomputer. If I was interested in seeing how it works, this makes it possible. It's so cool. That's, That's cool. Awesome. Uh, have you guys seen uh, the recent Kickstarter project? Uh, I think it's Raspberry Pi Mini XTI case. But basically, it it takes all the ports and kind of reroutes them into an ITX case. So it just simplifies making a, a standard computer. I don't know if you guys seen that. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. And that may be, right. you know, that may be a, a way to make it a little bit more user friendly. If there's a kid out there that wants to, you know, hook up a, a you know, make a computer for their sibling or their mom or whatever, yeah. it, it makes it seem a little bit more like a computer because I think when you've got a board that's bare like this, it's a little intimidating. I think, you know. It is. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, but thankfully, we have all these, you know, really cool cases. That kind of, yeah. you know, yeah, shine yeah. it up a little bit there. 
I know, um, Shed, we have a aluminum one that's all milled out because you're showing your uh, yeah. aluminum platform that someone made for you. They have a Raspberry Pi case that's uh, an aluminum block that's all milled out and it's all nice and you got a clear cover so the whole thing sits in there and it's uh, with little standoffs so it's insulated so you don't short out the bottom of the Raspberry Pi. That's rad. That's cool. great. Really? That's great. Hey, you need uh, to give it a little weight. You need like if you're hooking up a lot of cables to it, it's gonna f it moves all over the desk. So it's good to have a heavy one like that. Yeah. Weight. Right. Hey Matt, what do you think about getting back to some of that scratch programming? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Let me switch over. Uh, let me uh, switch back to my desktop here. Uh, bear with me a second. I gotta just change my setting. There we go. We got the bat, right? Can you see yep. it? Still going. Yep. Yeah, he's still going. Still yeah. That's the other thing about Man, computers. He's got a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, I'd be tired. <laughs> the computers will go and go and go until you say stop. So I'm going to say stop now. They're very, very patient. I remember when I was a kid and I was learning about computers, that was one of the first lessons. They're very, very patient. They'll just sit there <laughs> and keep doing something over and over again. So uh, I'm going to make I'm going to make this bat a little bit smaller first of all. Um, I'm going to say resize this sprite and I'm going to drag it in. I'm going to make them a little smaller. What I want to show is how you can use your keyboard to interact with these things as well. So let's say I wanted to make a game where this bat flies up and down, and 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 I want to use the keyboard buttons up and down keys to make that happen. So let's let's try to make that happen. Uh, let's see. There's this action here that says when space key is pressed. If I bring it over here, I can change it and say when up arrow is pressed. Okay. And if I go to motion, is where we're going to find the function to move it around. Now, something about this canvas here is that it's a like a, it's like a piece of graph paper. Okay. If you know a little bit of geometry or you worked with the graph paper before where you have coordinates, it's a coordinate system. In the middle here is 0, 0. That means x is 0 and y is 0. As you go up, y goes up. And I don't know if you can see down here, the y is changing when I move my mouse pointer up. Is, is that easy? Are you able to see that at all? Barely, yeah. Okay. Well, you'll take my word for it. And yeah, you go yeah. down, you pass 0, and you go into a negative number. So y changes as you go up and down. The okay, so y is up and down? Yep. The x value changes as you go back and forth. If I go forward, y go, uh, sorry, x goes up, and I go back, it's now at zero, around 0 again. If I go even further back, it's going into negative numbers. So this means we can use math to move this sprite around and move the character around on screen. If I know its current position, I can add a little bit to, let's say, the x value or the y value and have it change. So over here, we have the, the, a bunch of functions here that says set x to or change y by. If the up arrow is pushed, we want to use what, x or y? Uh, that's y. x. It's y. <laughs> <laughs> so up and so up is is y. So we're gonna drag change y by ten. So that's gonna add ten to the y value, which right now is zero. So I'm gonna hit the 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 go button. It's flapping its wings. Now I'm hitting the up button. You can see I'm going up. Huh, see? Going so. up. Now I kind of lost him here, and I'm hitting the down button. He's not coming down, right? Well, we've got to, we've got to take yeah. care of that. So let's add a new function for the down button. Let's say when the let's see down. I'm going to change this to say down arrow. And then I'm going to go back to motion. And once again we're going to use y because it's 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 an up and down thing that we're changing. We're going to say uh, change y by. Now these are pretty much the same right now. What happens if we want it to go down? We want to change y by a negative number. So I'll say negative 10 and hit enter. So now when I hit the down key, he's going down. And then up and down. Now let's awesome. say, yeah, let's say I want him. You want you want me to show you one more thing, and then we can go, yeah. get back to questions. Please, okay. yeah, definitely. So um, if I go to <laughs> control again, let's say we we want a function so that if I hit H, he goes back home. So let's drag this in. Another uh, when button is pressed. I'm going to drop this down and choose the letter H. I'm going to go back to motion, and I'm going to say set y to something. Rather than just changing it, just give it the value 0. So now I'm going to hit up, 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 up. Now if I hit h, he's back in the middle again. Okay. Huh, cool. So Now this may seem really basic and really simple, but this is the start of a game, don't you think? Like if we had yeah. like different, like maybe like fruit flying by, you could try to get the fruit for points, or there are obstacles like nets you wanted to avoid, you had to go up and down. This is all possible using Scratch. Uh, you know, to make a game, if you want, you could add sound effects. You could have all different kinds of things working. But 
you know, in, in no short time at all, we have a, a little character that we're controlling on screen, and I think that's pretty cool. That's awesome. That's really cool. I have a question here from, uh, sure. from Camper Ethan. He wants to know if you can use Scratch to create iPhone games. Hmm, I don't think you can. Um, you, you can use Scratch on the web, though. If you go to scratch.mit.edu, uh, there is a web-based interface that you can use Scratch with. You might be able to load that up on the iPhone. I'm going to guess no, um, but um, you, as far as like actually making an app on your iPhone, it's, we're probably a little ways away from that. But hey, I think that would be really cool to be able to do. Yeah, definitely. Can you uh, control let's... external things from, uh, from Scratch? So like right now you're playing a little game. Can you have something hooked into your Raspberry Pi and you push a button and the light turns on or something? Yeah, there are ways to do that. Um, I, I, I haven't tried it out myself, but I've heard that people have hooked in uh, di like different devices and it can send data out and or, or control things. I know there's a way to hack in there and do stuff like that. I, I've never tried it myself, though. Mm. Gotcha. But you know, you guys, you guys seen Makey Makey, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that like kind of controller thing. If you plug in a Makey Makey to this, it's just gonna work. So if you wanted to build out your own controller, that's a, that's another <laughs> great way. That's I think really Makey cool. Makey okay. and Scratch will work really well together. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, Camper Leo is asking you, Matt, what is your favorite thing to do with a Raspberry Pi? Ooh, I I think my favorite thing to do with Raspberry Pi is to put things online that aren't normally online. Um, in, in, it, I was really excited the fact that I could put a web server on this and have it actually serve a web page. And on that web page, I could draw buttons on the web page, and when I click on the button, it could turn my lamp on and off. And <laughs> that, was a, that was a neat moment where I was like, my lamp has a web page. <laughs> like, what does that mean? That's so cool. So, and Matt, so what's the URL? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's mattrichardson.com slash lamp. <laughs> um, so, so uh, you, but we, in in getting started with Raspberry Pi, we I, I there's a project in there called Web Lamp where I show how to do that. And what I thought was really cool was that someone out there had even taken that project and hooked up the Raspberry Pi to their coffee maker so that they could get their coffee maker going uh, when they were waking up or something, or you know when they're away that. and were coming home. They could turn it on. Um, it, 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 it makes that really fun. It's neat to think like, what in our world would we want to put online, and what in our like, w if it had a, a sort of an identity online, what would it be like? What would it act like? And I think it's fun to think about that. And and for the people out there who know what an API is, like you know, if you want to hook into Twitter, you can use the Twitter API. You can. It's a way of having you know one program talk to another over the internet. You can have a lamp give an API and have it communicate, you know, send a text message to it or do whatever you want to get it the could, lamp to work. It could it's have its own Twitter account. It, it could have its own Twitter account, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so when you kind of like open up that and you think about that and you think about like what in our world would change if it were online, then I think you could sort of think about how to connect weird things together and it's a lot of fun. Right. So there's there's actually a term for for connecting everything to the internet, right? What's that? Yeah, Internet of Things. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so um, that's the basic idea that you could theoretically connect pretty much anything to the internet. Um, yeah. You know, so your coffee machine, your lamp, your your bicycle, your your electronic cat feeder, anything you want to do, uh, you can absolutely. hook it up and automate it, right? Absolutely. So this is a this can be an affordable home automation then. Yeah, absolutely, right? I've, I've seen quite a few home automation systems with this thing. Yeah, absolutely. You can use Raspberry Pi for that. Um, and you, yeah, you can use it to connect things online at $35. You know, connecting your dog bowl to the internet <laughs> yeah. doesn't cost that much. So, right. you know. Yeah. Actually, I should make that project. I, <laughs> the, the internet connected dog bowl. You know when it's empty. There you go. <laughs> Your dog so, would be thankful. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. We have a few questions uh, from campers. Let's let's start off with: uh, Can you run the Raspberry Pi on batteries in any way, and how much would they cost? 
yes, you can run them on batteries, and um, I don't have one to show you right now, but have you ever gone to uh, you know electronic store? Sometimes I've seen them even in like a, a drug store. They have these like emergency um, like cell phone battery packs that have USB right. ports on the side. And so what you do is you charge up this battery pack, and then you take it with you, and if your cell phone dies, you can plug it in and it'll charge it up. Those things are perfect for powering up the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can do your own circuitry and electronics to build out a battery for Raspberry Pi, but I like those battery packs because they are, are, are just like everything is built into them. They, they already know how to stop charging when it's full. They can show you how charged they are. Um, and then also they're useful for cell phone stuff. Batteries like those will probably run you like $40 or so. But um, it, I used I used a battery like that, a cell phone emergency battery, uh, as the um, as my bike headlight battery, and that's how I got that working because I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to have a long cord uh, chasing after me as I bike around the city. So you use that to power the Raspberry Pi and the projector. Oh, so the projector had its own battery. A lot of these little mini projectors these days have their own battery packs and can can, can turn on. They're really, really tiny. They're portable. Again, I, I wish I had it to show you. Um, the uh, What's neat is to think that, like, you know, these projectors and these batteries are probably going to get smaller. And those things that we use to connect things to the Internet are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so yep. what, what, what fun things can we make when we have really long-lasting batteries and... and internet connected little modules that connect to the internet no matter where they are. It's like, wow, you could do a lot with that. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so uh, a question here from Trey. What's the difference between the $25 and the $35 Raspberry Pi? That's, that's a great question. And which so, one would you recommend buying? Uh, okay, so it depends. Um, uh, there is a uh, the $35 Raspberry Pi is called the Model B. That was the original one. That's the one that I'm holding right now. It has an Ethernet port there. It has a USB there, um, and it has 512 megabytes of RAM. That's the, that's the RAM. That, that's the memory that's used when you're running things. Um, the the $25 version is called the Model A. It does. It only has one USB port on it. It, and it does not have the uh, Ethernet port, and it only has 256 megabytes of RAM. Gotcha. So if you're looking for a computer to use and you're looking to experiment around, I would recommend to start off with a $35 Model B version of Raspberry Pi. If you make a project that you want to run off a battery or you, you know you don't need all the RAM or you don't need the, both the USB ports or the Ethernet port, go with the $25 one. Not only is it cheaper, but also it uses less power and means your project will last longer. Very cool. All right. Uh, so a question from George. Uh, he says, uh, I'm, all, I'm new to this. Uh, where can I learn more? Uh, where can I learn to program? And what language or code should I learn first? OK, great. Um, so there are, if, if getting started with Raspberry Pi, one way to do it. <laughs> That's one way to learn and get started. Tell I, <laughs> I see. It's my duty to plug that every time I, every chance I can. Um, no, but there are also plenty of resources online as well. If you go to raspberrypi.org, they have tons of resources that show you how to get started, get going with it. Um, some PDF uh, guides you can download. There are some classroom guides also. Uh, there's there's plenty of great resources online if you check out raspberrypi.org. Um, if you're looking to get started with programming. Um, it depends on what you want to do. Um, I would recommend clicking around with Scratch a little bit. Um, if you feel that you're a little bored by that or it's a little bit too, you know, you, you can take on something a little bit more challenging, I would definitely check out Python as a language. And this is the language I always recommend to beginners who want to get started with coding. First of all, it's a super powerful language. It can do lots of things out there. There are so many people using it. And it's probably the easiest to read and understand, arguably. I'm sure there are people out there who, who, who debate me on this. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you, got, if you get into Python and you look at the code, you can read it and kind of understand what it's doing. And then you can change it on your own. And you know, there are libraries out there for you know, connecting to hardware. There are libraries out there for connecting to websites that make it so easy to do whatever you want. So I would recommend any kind of like beginner Python uh, tutorial. There's a free one online called Learn Python the Hard Way. It sounds really bad, but it's actually really, really good. Um, it's a great way to learn <laughs> Python. He walks you through it step 
by step. And uh, I, and also, what's cool about Python is if you don't have a Raspberry Pi handy, most computers have Python on it. If you're on Mac, mm -hmm. you definitely have Python on, on it. If you're on Windows, it's easy to install. It's free, and you can start uh, writing code. When you're ready to move it over to the Raspberry Pi, you may be able to just drop it over there, and, and it's running. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so we've got a question here from Bob. Uh, can you put the Arduino software on the Raspberry Pi to program the Arduino? So, so can you uh, install an Arduino IDE on a Raspi? Yes, the, you can uh, install the uh, uh, Arduino IDE, the development environment, onto the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's just, I think you, it's basically as easy as running the command sudo apt get Arduino, and then you've got it, and it'll, you've got the window. It's everything you're used to. Oh. On on your 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 regular computer, you've got it all. It re it works and, and it works great. That's really simple. So if you're connected to the internet with your Raspi, what's the command? sudo sudo apt get apt dash get, and that's that's how you install new modules or new software or new libraries on Raspberry Pi, and then just space and then the word Arduino. And if you if, if you just look up Raspberry Pi Arduino IDE, it, I bet you it's the first result on on that, um, so you get the right command to do that. Cool. Uh, so Joey is asking, why do they call it a Raspberry Pi? Uh, you know, so Evan Upton, who's the founder of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, I asked him this myself, and I, if I remember the answer correctly, it started off with um, thinking about that. It started off with thinking about Python as a language, and and how it was a language that that was very accessible, and so it was a nod to Python, and then um, it was also a nod to all those other fruit flavored computers out there, you know, Apple, Apple and, and so on. Um, so they, they would love the idea of having the Raspberry, uh, uh, you know, the, the Raspberry thing in there. I'm probably totally botching that story, but that's, that's what he told me. <laughs> that's all right. Cool. Well, um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up for today. Uh, I want to thank you, Matt, for joining us. Uh, sure. Everybody out there, make sure to check out Getting Started with Raspberry Pi. Let's get this Matt. book. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's really helpful. It's, a, it's, a good, uh, <laughs> it's what we use. And Sean Wallace are the authors, so make sure to check that out. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks for having me. This was a yeah, lot man. of fun. You guys, yeah. I love Maker Camp, and it's so much fun. It's like, Seriously. I wish I had this when I was a kid. I went to an awful <laughs> camp. This is the best camp. So did I. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, counselors, thanks for joining us, and make sure to come back tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be visiting Oracle, uh, Team USA, America's mm. Cup boat. It's going to be ridiculously exciting. Uh, we've got, I mean, so many cool things happening there. I've never seen so much carbon fiber in my life, and uh, you guys <laughs> are, are going to be able to have the inside view there. And uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. All right. Good day, see you guys. guys. See you Bye. guys.